Okay. Yeah, turn them all off. Students, uh, I'd like to begin lecture, and I'd like to uh, draw your attention to this uh, video in YouTube. It's in my uh, area of YouTube uh, under the demonstrations playlist. Uh, you're going to have some homework uh, and some exam questions related to this video. We're going to talk about the spectrum of hydrogen um, at the end of class today. So I uh, just want to show you this before we got into the regular, um, uh, the regular part of lecture. Also, I'd like to also point out, can you do the, the, no, the uh, schedule, SSG schedule page. Oh, yeah. Can you do that? I uh, want to show you, okay, now here's the, here's our homepage in web courses and the SSG schedule page, uh, the link is up at the top, go ahead and click that. And here's what it looks like right now, a couple nerds for the picture at the top. Right below that, uh, go ahead to where it says signups link. Okay, the signups link is going to be right there below the photograph. And um, so, and I'm going to activate that tonight at 9 p.m. I was thinking 8 p.m., but it's going to be 9 p.m. Uh, and I want you to move really fast because um, it might, all the seats might be taken by 9.05. It just, it's like a real buffalo stampede in there, okay? Now, I've got this set up so that you can uh, look at different students. Now, these guys here at the top of the list don't have their, well, not yet. They don't, I haven't typed it in yet. I think I've got them now. Camille and Joseph and uh, Mivosh, uh, their time and place. We'll get that in there. I'll go ahead down towards the bottom now. Uh, here's Friday. Uh, Ashley's going to be doing a session tomorrow, uh, probably some other students. And then we've got some Saturdays. There's Christiana. Uh, and then we've got a Sunday session, uh, Javier. And we've got a couple Mondays. And that I'll be filling in the, all the Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays. And you'll be able to look at this. Go back up to the top. And um, if you click on, click on the Sunday icon... If you click the Sunday icon, it'll take you to the part of the list where you can look at all the Sundays. You know, go back up to the top. That's, that's good. All right. So, um, anyways, go ahead and take a look at that. And, to, and I, I highly recommend that you uh, – can you switch to presentation now? I highly recommend that uh, that you look at the schedule page – um, starting this afternoon, I'm going to do the YouTubes of today's lectures. And then right after that, I'm going to start putting the rest of the schedule together. You saw uh, four or five students in there that have their, their time and place. And we just got a bunch more up here. We got a couple dozen. And we've had a couple students say, no, Dr. B, I can't squeeze it into my schedule. And that's fine, too. But we're going to have a good number of special study groups running. and uh, But we don't have enough for everybody, so... Uh, give it your best shot. Try to get in there at 9 and see what the chips fall where they may. And basically what you're going to do is go, go to that link and you're going to click into the signups page through that link. And then once you're on the signups page, you'll see all the different groups. And all you got to do is click the word that says join and everything will be good. All right. Uh, questions about that? Yes, Taylor. Do you know if it'll like work properly on the app instead of the computer? Ooh. Will it the question is will it work properly on the app? Do you know if that's it probably should. Darian is I don't I don't use the app. So I I use sign through like All right. If it doesn't oh. work on the app, just go to web courses and whatever uh, browser you use, and it should work on that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it should work in Safari or something like that. Another question. Yes. Um, do you still have, like, the SSN? Yeah, I'll be talking about that in just a minute. 
But this is specifically about SSG for now. Yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, the uh, go. Can you bring the computer page back up? Okay, see this red box with the double outline where the cursor is? It says sign up links will be here, activated Thursday night, stay tuned. Okay, at 9 o'clock, that'll be a clickable link there. You'll click, you'll go to an, another page, which is where the actual signups are, and then all the lists, all the SSGs, and I'll identify them by the name of the SSG leader and the, the day and time. And just, but, but look at this schedule page first. Make sure you have an idea of what you want to shoot for and have one or two options in case your first choice doesn't, is already full, okay? And, but that's how it's going to work. It works pretty good, but except that you, it, there's not enough space for everybody, so you have to move fast, right? Any other questions about SSG? Okay, switch back to laptop. Thank you. All right. Um, I have an announcement concerning Passover, and I know that there's a few students uh, probably in this class that are going to be celebrating Passover next week. And if you have to be absent from exam three, um, uh, I want you to contact me. Come up at the end of class today, and then I'll talk to you for a minute. Or alternatively, Contact me directly through web courses inbox messaging, and because that's confidential, it's private, and uh, we'll try to coordinate on the excused absence. And just so you know, I usually double check Passover and Good Friday and stuff like that for my exam schedule, so that there's no conflict. But I forgot to do that this semester, so inadvertently I put exam three in the middle of Passover, which usually I don't do that. So. Anyways, I apologize, but we're going we're gonna to work at your excused absence, but i got to talk to you about it. Uh, so talk to me at the end of class for just a minute, and then in uh, and or in uh, inbox messaging. Okay, questions about that? Okay, uh, further getting ready for exam three. And I'll have a little mention of SI in just a minute. But first, uh, chapters. Um, everybody always, it's kind of amusing, you know, if students are always, what chapters are going to be on the exam? Uh, we've did, been doing a little bit of hopping, skipping, and jumping through the chapters. We covered a lot in chapter seven, but we skipped uh, a, fair, a few fairly good-sized chunks. Same thing with chapter 8 and 9. But as I always say, if we talk about it in lecture, it's up for grabs on the exam. Or if we talk about it in homework. So the additional readings that we've had, uh, yeah, I, I consider that fair game uh, for, uh, for exam questions. All right. Now, I don't usually make a list of all the concepts, a study guide, uh, but you can do that. Uh, make it your study task to, to uh, figure out a, a rundown of the chapter subsections from 7, 8, 9, and 10, and, and that'll help you. That'll help you get your thoughts together uh, for the exam. I want to reemphasize that we're going to have a code question. Uh, we had a Chuck Norris code question on Tuesday just for fun. We're going to do another one of those. Uh, on exam three, and it will be a scientific code question. It won't be a screwing around Chuck Norris fact uh, type question. So you'll be answering some serious physics thinking with that. We've talked about that already. Uh, so bring your eye clicker. Here's the other things that you need to bring just to review. Uh, raspberry colored Scantron with the UCF Pegasus logo. Uh, number two pencil and a good eraser. By the way, I am going to, if, I'm looking around the room. There was a student on exam two that had about 17 dots that were so faint 
they couldn't be read by the computer. We had to go back and dig at it, everything and grade it by hand. Make sure that you have a good pencil and don't bubble in too faintly. Good eraser, bring your calculator uh, and of course bring your eye clicker and then we'll have code question and calculations as usual. Uh, all right. Uh, SI review tonight, four to six. And then, of course, you have your regular session right after this class, uh, 1.30 p.m. over in, I don't know where it is, uh, engineering or something like that, HPA. Wherever it is on Thursdays, you're going to have that plus the special two-hour review tonight. Uh, and as I always like to emphasize, the more interaction that you can have with me, with Darian, with Caroline, and Caroline has office hours Friday. Uh, what are they, 1.30? I think one thirty to 2.30. To 2.30 in the Physical Sciences Building. Uh, with M Maria in in SI with your classmates in special study groups, the SSG leader. The reason that they're in there is they're doing good and so they can give you some good tips if you make it to your SSG. If you have a study partner that you like to study with and they're doing fairly good, the more of that kind of interaction that you can do as you prepare for this exam the better things are going to go for you on the exam because A, you're going to learn the material better and B, you're going to be more confident. You're going to move with more confidence through the test simply because working with another human being uh, in this class, whether it's me or SI or, or anybody else, it forces you to think. And thinking is where I want you to be. I don't want you memorizing. I'm going to give you stuff. You know, like that home. You know, here's a good one. Homework 15. Is that what it was, Mivash, that we went over? With the, with the, the beat wavelength. The, the brain burner on homework 15. It's not hard. It's right there. But it is a brain burner. And the only way to get that is because you can't game it. I mean, homework, you can game it. You know, there was three options on that one. So four attempts, you're going to get that one right if you game it. But I had a student come in and say, Dr. B, you know, I got this one right. I don't know why. Can you help me figure it out? And so we worked it out together. We talked it over and stuff. That's what you want to be able to do. You have to be able to think. So memorize the stuff. Man, maybe you're going to have a little bit of usefulness with that. But thinking is, that's where you're going to get a lot of points. So if you want to crush my exam three, like a bug, as many of you want to do, as many of you I hope will do, you've got to think. Thinking is where I want you to be. Okay. So studying with a friend, starting with SI, studying in office hours is the way to go. Question. Repeat? Yeah, it went from four to six. Uh, the question was, what's going on with homework for 15? It went from four to six points. And it, I, it has some little, I, I don't know what you guys see. I, that's part of the problem I have. Is there, there's a, it's a lightning bolt yeah. indicating that it's got to be regraded. And the, the reason that there was a problem is I set up home, that homework with the first problem, which was actually like three, well, kind of like matching type things. And it should have been a three-point question instead of a one-point question. So I'm gonna, I converted it to a three-point question. And now Miss Darian and Caroline have to go through and re, you know, give everybody you know, one, two, or three points, or zero points on that. So. But we'll get it. Don't worry about it. Usually the, the 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 canvas is strange. It's it's unpredictable. I it sometimes it'll ask 
if I want everything to be regraded, when I change the homework like that, but this one it didn't ask me, so I don't know. It's, Canvas is kind of a pain, Dominic. It's just, ooh. Anyways, another question before we continue. Concerning exam three. You can give that to Darian. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, gravity versus electricity. This is our first main topic for today. Um, and I, I alluded to this last time, and I said that uh, in order to understand the periodic table, you have to understand that all of the periodic table is mostly a huge encoding of electromagnetic interactions for the different elements. And so what I want, and, and so you ignore gravitation. Now gravitation doesn't disappear. There's always, for instance, between an electron and a proton in a hydrogen atom, you still got gravitational interaction because they have mass. You know, the electron has a little bit of mass. The proton has quite a bit more. Uh, they have electric charge. So, yeah, they're, they're bound in the neutral hydrogen atom. They're bound together. Uh, the, the lowest energy state, you know, the distance from the nucleus out to the electron is uh, approximately 0 0.05 nanometers. That's 5 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Now, don't worry about memorizing that. That's... Uh, something that if I was going to ask you to use it and think with it, I would put it on the cover page. I might put it on the cover page, but I don't, I don't, I, prob I probably won't. But don't worry, worry about measuring that. What we're going to do is try to compare the interactions. So uh, gravitationally, uh, each object has mass. Now, I made my diagram in the lower right. Um, where I'm talking about, where I'm focusing on the gravitational interaction, I made the electron and the proton both gray colored because all, you know that saying, all cats are gray at night? Well, gravitationally speaking, uh, every kilogram is gray. There's no plus or minus kilograms. There's only kilograms. And they all attract. Now, I have color for the upper left diagram. Uh, where I mentioned the Coulomb interaction because uh, the Coulomb interaction admits uh, repulsion and attraction because there are two charges and they're important to know. It's important to distinguish between the two because what the electron does, it's acceleration. If there's any acceleration, a proton is going to get an acceleration in exactly the opposite direction. So it's this, you know, harem scarum type situation, unless you're very, very careful. So what we're going to do is try to sort things out, and we're just going to look at the strength and see which of the interactions is stronger, all right? So that means we're going to, for instance, envision um, the contest between gravity and electromagnetism. And we're going to do it at a set distance of about 0 0.05 nanometers. But what we're going to find out is that the distance doesn't have to be specified at all. By the way, in the way that we're going to handle it, it's going to work out pretty nice. It could be 0 0.05 nanometers or 0 0.05 light years. Because no matter how far apart they are, the proton, a proton and an electron will interact gravitationally and electromagnetically. They might not be an atom, but it'll be, um, they'll still interact. So let's get down to some basic specs here uh, for each uh, particle, electron and proton. The charges, we know this, negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb for the electron, same size but positive, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb for the proton. 
Good. We've talked about that. The symbol for that uh, small amount of charge is E. Minus E for the electron and regular E for the proton. The masses are different. And this is something we didn't, I didn't give you the numbers with this last time. I just said you, to you that the proton was about 2,000 times more massive. It's still pretty small, but it's 2,000 times heavier. Okay, for the electron, we've measured it carefully, 9.11 approximately, times 10 to the minus 31. For the proton, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. Whoa, it's pretty big. It's roughly, the ratio of those two is 1 over 1,837. So approximately 1 to 2,000. That's what I was mentioning. In other words, the mass of the electron is about 1 2,000th of the mass of the proton, or 1 1,837th of the mass of the proton, as we've measured both of them. There's ways to do it. Now, so make sure you have these. We're going to be putting together some bodacious equations in just a few minutes. And uh, and when we do that, you're going to have to have the, the right numbers in there. And I'll show you how to work it out. I've got something in mind. All right, so here's my two interaction pictures, right? And I'm going to keep the picture up here uh, the same. You know, the blue and the red, blue electron, red proton. And I'm keeping that sketch, the same, th those two objects the same size because they have the same size electric charge. Just one of them is minus. One of them is negative. But now down here, for gravitational, uh, the masses are definite, definitely different. So I really shouldn't be using uh, circles of the same size. I mean, we're eventually going to let the numbers do the talking. But if, if I wanted to go by volume or size, um, I'd have to make quite a bit different picture. So I'm going to change the two uh, pictures down here on the bottom, or I'm going to make a new version of the pair of electron and, pot, electron and proton in the lower right. Okay, and what we do is look at the volume. The mass goes by volume, so um, if you have more volume, you have more mass. Right? So 1837 times more volume means that you have 1837 times more mass, and that the radius is about 12 and a, 12.25 times bigger. So the radius, the ratio radius, excuse me, the radius ratio is 1 to approximately 12.25. Now what that means is if you take 12.25, and go ahead and get your calculators out because we're going to need them in a second. 12.25 um, to the third power is a, you can verify this on your calculator, 12.25 uh, to the third power is approximately 1837. Anybody verify me on that? 12.25. I see somebody up front here. 12.25 uh, to the third power should be 1837. Yeah, okay, that's pretty close. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. So, yeah, it's going to, so that's what I mean. So, if, so in other words, doubling the radius would give me 8 times the volume. Multiplying the radius by 12.25 would give me 1,837 times the volume, and therefore it, So really, if I was going to make my diagram proportional to the mass, it would look like this. Whoa. Go ahead and sketch a ginormous proton somewhere on your page. And down here, there's a little teeny electron. Yeah. Dude, there it is. All right. So that's 
approximately times the radius. And I made my diameters 37 and 453 pixels. And so you can check that. And then if you think about it in three dimensions, then, you know, the, 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 the air, the, excuse me, the volume of a sphere, uh, we don't really know if the, if the proton is a sphere or the electron is a sphere, but if you think of them as a sphere, the volume of a sphere is four-thirds times pi times the third power of the radius. Okay, so... Anyway, so that's what the, if, if we made the proton proportional in size, um, in proportion to its mass, this is what it would look like. But we're going to let the numbers do the talking because what we're trying to do is compare the interaction strength, right? We're going to see which interaction, well, we know it's electricity. Electricity, the electromagnetic interaction is stronger. We know that. But let's figure out exactly how much stronger. Kane, do you have a question? Pixels, yeah, pixels, yeah. That was the size of each of those two circles. All right, now we're going to do some nasty equations here. All right, you're just going to have to. Copy them once in your notebook, and don't worry about having to recopy them or spit them out on the test, but I definitely want you to look at them. All right, now the first one up on top here is the force of gravitation between the proton and the electron. All right, and the one down on the bottom is the force of the Coulomb interaction between the proton and the electron. All right, let's do the one on top. GMP times ME divided by the square of the distance, all right? Now, I'm not specifying the distance, although I could, 0.05 nanometers, quantity squared if I want to, but I'm not going to do that. But I do have to put in capital G in square brackets up here in the top equation. Uh, it's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Yuck. Gross. Ew. But that's Newton's constant in the metric system. It converts um, the product of two masses divided by the square of a distance into Newtons. That's the constant. All right now, the first parenthesis in the numerator of this first equation. 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. All right, that's the mass of the proton. All right. Now, my gravitational interaction, I need the mass of the electron. That's the second parenthesis. 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. All right. And numerator is r squared. Now, we're not going to mess around with r squared, but let's get... The electromagnetic interaction squared away down here. All right, here we go. Now, over here, according to Professor Coulomb in Paris, it's KQ1, Q2 over R squared, or in this case, Coulomb's constant K, times the charge Q on the proton, times the charge Q on the electron. All right. In the metric system, Coulomb's constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Capital C is a Coulomb. It's not lowercase c for the speed of light. It's capital C for Coulomb. All right? That's the constant of proportionality. It converts the square of a charge, or the product of two charges, divided by the square of a distance into Newtons. All right, the charge on the proton, positive 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then the second parenthesis in the numerator of the bottom equation, negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. That's the electron charge, right? Now we got all this stuff plugged in there. Oh my goodness. 
and it's kind of nasty. Uh, it's gross, a lot of numbers, and a lot of powers of 10, and the Newtons. And, oh, it's, but we're going to do something nice and make life a little bit nicer for us by taking the ratio. We're going to go Fe divided by Fg. And that's going to tell us the ratio of the strengths. Right? So we got all the numbers kind of parked in there right now. Now we're going to do a fraction or a ratio of those two. And it's still going to be kind of bodacious. But let's work on it. Let's see what we can do. Now, one nice thing is when you put these things into ratio, you can cancel R squared because R squared, this one up here for FG, up here at the top, that first equation, R squared, that's going to be in the denominator of my ratio because my ratio is FE divided by FG. Okay, so R squared is going to be in the denominator of my ratio. And it's in, it's, it's in the denominator here. Now, this denominator, R squared, that's going to be in the numerator of my ratio. So that one cancels out. So just go ahead and boom, cross those two babies out. And that is why, Cain, the size of the, dis the, the distance between them does not matter when you're trying to compare strengths. Okay? They may, if, if they're 0.05 light years apart, you might not have an atom, but you'd still have interaction, and it, but it would still cancel. So the distance apart doesn't really come into this. But what does come into it are the two constants, capital G and lowercase k, Newton's constant and Coulomb's constant, and then the masses, mp and me, and then the charges, plus and minus e. All right, here we go. Now, let's put our ratio together. Oh, my goodness. Look at what we got here. We got the electrical on top, and we got... All right, so that's this jazz down here from the bottom. It's in the numerator now. All right, and we, we ditch the R squared. Ching, it's out of there. And then 6.67, et cetera, et cetera, that's in the denominator, simply because I want gravity on the bottom. This number is going to be um, greater than 1 to symbolize how many times stronger the electromagnetic interaction is than gravity. Right? Now, it's, this is highly bodacious, but go ahead and copy it down once. You won't have to recopy it or regurgitate it for the exam or for the final. But it's good to, you know, give your, you know, your writing pencil a workout. Give your brain a workout. Here it is up on top. And now let's, what we're going to do here is we're going to take the numerical part and work with that. And then we're going to take the powers of 10 of each term in the numerator, each term in the denominator, and we're going to park those powers of 10 off to the side and deal with them separately. All right, so here we go. 8.99 up here in Coulomb's constant. All right, so I'm just going to put that down here in square bracket. And I'm going to put the power of 10 over to the side for a minute. All right, now, charge of the proton, 1.60. And I'm going to take that 10 to the minus 19, and I'm going to park it over to the right. And then my next numeric part, negative 1.60 from the charge of the electron, I'm going to park that in next to the other parenthesis, and I'm going to handle its power of 10 separately. Matter of fact, let's do it right now. All right? The powers of 10 in the numerator, let's look at it. I've got 10 to the 9th, okay, so that's 9 powers of 10, 10 to the minus 19, and 10 to the minus 19 again. So I get negative 38 plus 9, that's a total of minus 29, negative 29. And that's why my power of 10 in the numerator 
boils down to 10 to the minus 29. And my unit is newtons. Because that's what I get. Everything cancels in, in the numerator. I get something times 10 to the minus 29 newtons. All right. Now let's do the same thing for the denominator. Okay, that's the gravitational stuff. 6.67 from Newton's constant. That's in square brackets. And there's nothing fancy about square brackets. I just wanted a different shape so to separate the constants from the, the physical measurements. Physical measurement number uh, one in the denominator, 1.67, mass of the proton, and its power of 10 is off to the side. The second physical measurement, mass of the electron, 9.11, and its power of 10 is parked over to the side, Mick. So now let's take a look at the powers of 10. Let's go back up here and to the denominator up here in the top equation block. And let's look, take a look at it. Okay, minus 11. Whoa. Minus 27. Whoa. That's, that's 10 to the minus 38 right there. And then I've got 10 to the minus 31. Holy buckets. So that's in the denominator. I've got newtons. And I've got 10 to the minus 69. Whoa. That's, that's a lot of negative powers of 10. All right. So now the powers of 10, 10 to the minus 29 divided by 10 to the minus 69. Okay, Jasmine, 10 to the minus 69 downstairs in the denominator is like 10 to the regular 69 upstairs in the numerator. So if you have 10 to the regular 69 in the numerator and 10 to the minus 29 in the numerator, that's a total of 10 to the regular 40. Right? And that's what we got over here. Now, the rest of you guys... You can figure out the numerator here, 8.99 times 1.6 times 1.6, negative. Uh, and hopefully, verify that on your calculator, you should get a negative 23. Anybody verify me on that? Good, okay. All right, now, same thing on the bottom. Tackle the parentheses. Uh, 6.67, 1.67, and 9.11. Uh, anybody verify me at 101 approximately? Good. All right. Now, we're only doing this calculation once. So don't worry about having to redo this on a test. Now, if you were in Physics 1 for engineering and, and science students, yeah, yeah, you'd have to do at least one or two calculations with these babies. But for us guys, no. But what I want to draw your attention to is the following. The size of this ratio, something times 10 to the 40th power. Now ignore that minus sign. that Because now we're talking sizes, so really you can erase that minus next to the minus 23. Focus on this. If so, put up a, a star next to the 10 to the 40th power. If these forces, Camille, were equal, then you wouldn't have 10 to the 40th, you'd have 1. You wouldn't have negative 23 over 101, you'd have 1 times 10 to the 0th power. That's equal to 1. But they're not equal. The numerator. My wonderful students, go ahead and make a note of this. The numerator is about 10 to the 40th times bigger than the denominator. Let me repeat that. The numerator is approximately 10 to the 40th times bigger than the denominator. The numerator is the electrical force. The denominator is the gravitational force. So what that tells you is that the strength ratio is appro approximately 10 to the 40th, right? And we're ignoring the 23 over 101. 
Forget about that. Because that, that, it's still ginormous. That would be about negative 0 0.2 something. But the real import, and this is the bottom line, this is why we are doing this, is simply this, this last thing. The strength ratio is approximately 10 to the 40th. And my wonderful students, what that means is centimeter for centimeter, newton for newton, the electrical interaction is 10 to the 40th times bigger than the gravitational interaction. If you have both objects, if both objects are charged, even if it's proton to proton, you know, if you have two protons at one meter apart, the, the, the distance apart doesn't matter. You'd have a repulsion force and a gravitational interaction force, but the sizes would still be approximately 10 to the 40th. My wonderful students, I don't even know what kind of number that is. 10 to the, four, 10 to the 40th is a 1 followed by 40 zeros. So let's see, we'll see if we can count it up here. Three zeros is a thousand, six is a million, nine is a billion, twelve is a trillion, fifteen is a half, we're not even halfway there, fifteen is a quadrillion, eighteen quintillion, twenty twenty one powers of ten. A seventillion, heptillion, I guess. Twenty-four powers of ten, octillion. Twenty-seven powers of ten, ninotillion. Thirty powers of ten, tenotillion. We're not even. 33 powers of 10, 11 trillion. 36 powers of 10, 12 trillion. 39 powers of 10, th I don't even know what that is, 13 trillion. And then we got 10 of those, 10 of the 40th. Do you want to know what it is? What is it? It's 10 duo decillion. Say that into the microphone. It's 10 duo decillion. Okay. Did you write that down in your notes? Good. That'll be on the test. Not. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll put that on the test and I'll put it on the cover page. Just for, for extra excitement. Kane. Yeah, mm -hmm. one, one times 10 to the 0th power. 10 to the 0th power is 1. So the scientific notation, if you were doing scientific notation, it's a number times 10 to the some power, but 1 is equal to 1 times 10 to the 0th power. So it'd be, you know, so if they were equal, uh, you'd have a 1. If they were double, you'd have a 2. If 1 was twice as strong. But we've got... What was that again? Duodectillion? Ten duodecillions. Ten duodecillions. Times stronger. Yes, yeah, centimeter for distance for distance. Pull for pull. Newton for Newton of pull. It's ten to the fortieth times. So, my wonderful students, this is why the periodic table is almost all electrical. You never worry about gravitational forces when you're trying to figure out chemistry. Right? It's there, but it's so weak that you don't really have to worry about it. It's not even an ant. There's not even 10 to the 40 on the, on the Earth. I mean, there's zillions of ants on the Earth. Okay? And then if you take into account all the bugs on Earth, there's not even close to 10 to the 40th bugs, all right? In fact, in the entire history of the Earth, there's not even close to 10 to the 40th bugs. That We don't even know anything that there's ever been or ever will be 10 to the 40th of it. It's just like this enormous number. But for the two electrical, for these two forces, 
That's what it is. All right, well, now let's get down to atoms and stuff. And to talk about atoms, we have to talk about volts and electron volts. Now, last time we talked about the Van de Graaff generator. Here's a picture of Benji doing a great job with his demonstration, his hair flying out into the universe. And they were, uh, and, and Frankie for first hour, they were um, touching that gold sphere, positively charged. And we drew the field lines for the positive sphere, and we drew field lines for the negative sphere. And then we did a dipole. We did the field lines for a dipole. Hopefully that's in your notes. The field lines for a positive sp sphere move radially outward. In this picture, uh, they would radiate outward like spokes of a wheel. But in three dimensions, it would be like quills of a porcupine going out equally spaced in all three dimensions. And that is what a positive test charge would do. However, a negative test charge, so if I have a, a positive test charge, yeah, we know what's going to happen with that. But a negative test charge, or a negative, like a little teeny electron over here, yeah, that's a, that's, hold on a second. Yes, lovely one. Okay, uh, I'm in the middle of lecture. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, sorry. <laughs> My wife. She forgot I was in lecture. <laughs> okay, no, I don't want that. Listen to this. Siri, no, Siri, I didn't ask you anything. Yeah, I have a British voice for it. Why not? Okay, so I so go ahead and make a sketch here, positively charged sphere, field lines going out like wagon wheel spokes, radially outward, and I've got a couple circles in dashed lines around the sphere itself. So the sphere is kind of brownish yellow. There's some plus signs on it, and they're equally spaced. The field lines are equally spaced. They go straight outward. And I've got a positive red test charge and a negative blue electron parked there at two different levels. And we know what the, the uh, small positive test charge will do. It'll move outward. Did you see that? Look at this. Here it goes. Positive test charge. Yay. All right. It moves away. And what, what does that tell us about the electrical potential energy means that the higher EPE for the proton is closer to the sphere because it goes away from it, it it gets some kinetic energy by moving away so that means closer to the surface is higher potential energy electrical potential energy all right now, on, when we were talking about basketballs, it was similar. The higher up you are for the basketball, the higher the potential energy. And the minimum of potential energy was the floor. And we called that zero. It works differently for charges, though. A small negative charge is going <coughs> to behave differently. Yep. Time for me to sneeze every day at this time. <laughs> it's it's got to be the air system. It's unbelievable. It's like clockwork. Okay, small negative charge. So so here's my small negative charge out here. I'm out here on the outer circle, and what happens to it if you let it go? Ching! It moves down towards the positive charge, towards the positively charged sphere. So it moves closer to the sphere. So for the electron, higher EPE is further away from the sphere. Now this is important for us because this model, I mean, we're thinking about the Van de Graaff generator, but really you can use the same kind of a scheme to think about a positive nucleus and a bunch of electrons. 
Okay? And the higher EPE for an electron is going to be far away from the nucleus. So that's why we're trying to get it. Now the problem is one of these lines is the high potential energy line. You know, the inner circle, go ahead and make a side note. It's not a, in the slide, but you can write, write this down. The inner circle, the close-in circle, is high potential energy for the proton. Yeah, the dashed circle right outside the sphere. That's high potential energy for the proton. But the high potential energy circle for the electron is the outer one. So that's a little bit confusing. And basically it's because, unlike the gravitational interaction, there's repulsion and attraction with electromagnetic interaction. So the, the whole idea of electrical potential energy is a little bit confusing. And that's why we abstract away the charge for a concept called voltage. And then that's what we use for spatially defining energy states around either a positive or a negative charge sphere or any other object of any shape. We try to figure out the voltage. So volts are high near a positive sphere and lower as you move away. We use the behavior of the positive test charge, the red one, to define the field lines and to define the voltage. In your textbook, in chapter 8, there's another vocabulary word, electrostatic potential. Not electrostatic potential energy, electrostatic potential. That is another name for voltage. Now, I tend to use the word voltage but really, I should be, you know, in a fancy textbook with a bunch of calculus equations and stuff and a ton of trig, you'd be using the term electrostatic potential. But we'll just call it the voltage. And so, consequently, using the abstraction of volt to abstract out the, the charge, we say that protons drop from higher to lower voltage. That's what they do. All right? So if they're near a positive charge sphere, the higher voltage is near the sphere, and they move away from that. If they have a negative sphere, the higher potential energy would be farther away from the sphere. So they'd move toward the sphere if it was a negative sphere. Now, positive sphere... Electrons move towards higher voltage. So electrons are kind of opposite Robin. You know, whatever the proton does, voltage-wise, the electron does just the opposite. And that's how I think about a lot of stuff, you know. You think about, all right, here's what the protons are doing. Here's what the positive test charge is doing. But the things in an, a real electrical circuit, Jihan, that actually move, are the electrons. So you figure out whatever the positives are doing and then you say to yourself, okay, what's really happening are the electrons are going to the left or moving up or you know whatever it happens to be. So voltage, electrical potential energy and voltage. Here's the relationship. A charge times a voltage is a quantity of energy. So, for instance, one coulomb times one volt is one joule. A coulomb per second is an ampere. And that means that if you have a circuit in your home where you have a one ampere circuit and you're going through one volt of voltage, that means you're doing one joule per second of work through that wire. And uh, joules, coulombs, and volts are good for everyday scale. <clears throat> Another energy scale is this. The fundamental charge of nature, E, times one volt. That works good, too. 
It's called the electron volt, and it is actually the best unit for studying atoms. Molecules and stuff like that. One electron volt, it's pretty tiny compared to the everyday size joule. 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's all right. Atoms are tiny, and the energy differences in an atom are tiny. But it just so happens that the energy levels of atoms are easily described with fairly small numbers of electron volts. And we're going to do that uh, right now. Let me pause for questions, though. All right. Uh, and just as a, another additional note, side note, uh, we had another energy unit that we typically use, the calorie. So there's different energy units, you know, different distance units. You know, astronomers, they think in terms of light years, you know, because that's how far stars are away. They don't think in terms of centimeters, although they could. Uh, same thing with energy units. So let's talk about hydrogen. Here's a picture of a proton and an electron. And notice that I've got four circles circling, thanks, circling around the proton. That's a hydrogen atom, right? And what we have found by observing the light from hydrogen, as I mentioned concerning the YouTube video, we have seen that certain specific colors um, are generated by a pure hydrogen lamp. So what we do is we take a, a small uh, ev glass tube, evacuate all the air, and put a little bit of hydrogen gas in it, and then zap it with high voltage. It won't be really hot, necessarily, but it will gener generate light, but only certain specific colors of light, as you'll see on the YouTube video. It doesn't produce all the colors of the rainbow. Now, if you look at an incandescent light source, even these lights in the, the top of the, the lecture hall, and I think even the uh, light bulbs in the projector are incandescent. They get really hot, those things. Uh, street lights um, frequently are incandescent street lights, old-fashioned ones. Uh, they'll produce something that's producing light because it's hot, like the surface of the sun, uh, will produce all the colors of the rainbow. And that's, that's how we get a rainbow, that's from sunlight. You know, refracting through drops of water, form a rainbow. Uh, but we don't get that from a pure source of hydrogen that's being zapped by high voltage. We just get certain specific colors. And therefore, we have deduced that because of that, it must be true that electrons live at only certain specific orbits and that those orbits are countable. Now, that's an important word. That's part of the quantum principle that some things can be counted. A quantum system uh, has something that's countable, whether it's energy, angular momentum, you know, states. Uh, and an example of what I mean between by countable uh, and continuous, the rainbow is continuous. Uh, all the colors of the rainbow is one continuous blend from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, all the way to violet. That's called a continuous spectrum. The spectrum of hydrogen is a quantized spectrum. The difference being that you can count everything in the spectrum of hydrogen. You can't count the numbers in the spectrum of a rainbow. There's just it's, it's a continuous infinity. Even though it's a finite number of colors, we still think of it as a continuous distribution. And therefore, in, kind of like the distance uh, between two points on a line is a finite number. But the number of points between the endpoints on a line segment is infinity. 
right? And that's a continuous infinity, not a countable infinity. Because EPE, electrical potential energy, is energy of position, that means that the EPE, the electrical potential energy, is restricted to certain values. And that means that the energy is quantized. Each orbit has a certain orbital energy and no other. We don't think that electrons live in between these orbital energies. Certain energies only. And that rhymes with the different certain colors uh, of light produced by a hydrogen lamp. And here's the kicker. The electrons, because EPE is energy of position and position is quantized, certain energy levels, um, when an electron drops to a lower orbit, it's a very specific level of uh, delta E. When you bump it, you know, if you, if you punch a hydrogen atom, you know, with a laser or something, and you bump an electron up, it will only bump up by certain amounts of energy, the energy between any two orbits. All right, now, let's take a look at the energy levels. And they come in units of electron volts. Okay, so here's my atom. And my, in, my, my first comment to you is this, that the energy levels, it, it, scientists agreed on, uh, over 100 years ago, that they consider the lowest energy level to be a negative number, and then, then they would increase towards uh, smaller negatives and then to positive numbers. So the lowest level, N equals 1, and that's where my electron is parked in this diagram, the energy of that orbital level for hydrogen is negative 13.6 electron volts. For the first excited state, the N equals 2 energy level, negative 3.4 electron volts. Hey, you guys, can you verify what's 3.4 times 4? 4 times 3.4. 13.6, not a... Not a uh, Kalinkadink. Third energy level, the second excited state. See, when Darian and I were doing the demonstration with the standing waves, I was describing it in terms of excited states because I'm thinking about electrons and, and atoms and stuff like that, not acoustics. Anyways, second excited state, N equals 3 in the quantum organization of the hydrogen atom. Uh, negative 1.5. Uh, can you multiply negative 1? It's actually negative 1.5 something. Negative 1.5 times 9. Yeah, negative 13.5. And actually, if you, if you include another digit, it would be close to negative 13.6. N equals 4. Negative 0 0.9. Uh, what's... 0 0.9 times 16. 14. See, and we're, we're getting a little round off problems here, but 16, 9, 4. Yeah, there's a reason for that. That number, the square of that number, we'll be talking about it on Thursday next week. Elizabeth. N equals 1. The number is 1. 1 squared is 1. So it's 13.6 it's times 1 over N squared. Yeah, and N is equal to 1. It's you know, 1 over 1 times 13.6. So it works. It's kind of cool how it works out. I'll show you more about this next Thursday. Now put some dot, dot, dots. And for higher energy levels, the way that they've got this set up is that the hydrogen atom, the limit for high N, as N goes to infinity, is um, zero. All right, so it's 
you know, for, for us with the basketball example, we started with potential energy, you know, like positive 32.4 or something and zero at the, at the basketball uh, at the floor, right? This one, we start at zero for the highest energy level and go to a negative number, negative 13.6. And that is why we consider 13.6 to be the binding energy of the N equals one electron. If you're in N equals two, first excited state, your binding energy is 3.4 electron volts. Here's another way to think about it. The ionization energy, if you want to totally evacuate the electron to ionize this hydrogen, you have to give it just a little bit more, 13.7 electron volts. If you can zap that N equals 1 electron with 13.7, you'll bust it out of the um, atom and you'll have 0.1 electron volts for kinetic energy. So it'll kind of move along at, you know, a little bit of 1 half mv squared, you know, 0.1. If you, if you give it 14 even, you'll have 0.4 electron volts of kinetic energy, etc., etc. So the ionization energy uh, of the hydrogen atom, 13.6 electron volts. Now what we're going to talk about on Thursday next week we're going to talk about ionization energies, melting points, and all kinds of stuff in the periodic table. So you'll have some a study homework tonight, a mini review homework in web courses. And I want you to look at this. And hey, you guys, listen carefully now. Take your sunglasses out of your mouth. Open up your ears. I saw some guy over here with his sunglasses in his mouth. Open your ears. I'm going to ask two questions on exam three about this video. So I want you to look at it, talk with your neighbors about it, and be ready. One regular question and one bonus point question. So it might be one bonus point and one regular point. All right? And I'll see you on Thursday. Or I'll see you on Tuesday next week. What's that? Today's on the test. Yes, of course. Everything up to and including today. Always.